I just want to thank everyone from Facebook Workplace for inviting me to speak at this year's Flow Conference. And I know I'm here to talk to you about my book, Hidden Figures, but what I wanted to do was start by telling you about something that happened to me a couple of years ago as I was reading another book. So for almost a year after my book came out in September 2016, I traveled almost constantly. I was speaking, I was participating in Hidden Figures related events. And this was particularly true and intense after the movie came out in December 2016. So, Finally, in the summer of 2017, my husband and I were able to take a little vacation and get some downtime. And my carry-on bag, as it always is um, on the plane, was full of books. And I probably should have packed books like Da Vinci Code, Inferno, or John Grisham's latest book, but I was still so deep in the geekery of hidden figures that I took things like my marked up copy of Thin Airfoil Theory, which is this <laughs> uh, aeronautics textbook from the 1950s. Um, but one of the ideas that I packed was called The Idea Factory by John Gertner. And this is the story of Bell Labs, AT&T's research and development unit, which, um, you know, I had spent a lot of the 1990s and 2000s actually working in digital media in New York. And I have to admit, until reading The Idea Factory, I really had just taken for granted that communications technology works. I didn't, wasn't very well versed in the physics of how it worked. And I didn't know that much about the history of the telecommunications industry, though I will admit to being old enough to remembering when a telephone was this big chunky thing with a long curly wire that plugged into a wall. Um, so I decided to save thin airfoil theory for the beach. That's a real beach reading kind of book. Um, <laughs> and I started reading The Idea Factory on the plane on the way to vacation. And the book's jacket copy describes this story as a deeply human story about the extraordinary men who laid the foundation for the information age. And indeed, it is a drama. It's an excellent book, highly recommended, starring many of the industry's founding fathers, like Claude Shannon, who pioneered the theory behind communications networks, and William Shockley, who won a Nobel Prize for research that led to the development of the transistor. Of course, Shockley then went on to infamy as one of the America's best known and most unapologetic eugenicists. Um, but reading about these people and the ideas that took us from the telegraph to smartphones, I felt the same sense of wonder that I felt when I got to relive, relive the evolution of flight from the Wright Brothers flyer, the first airplane, to the Apollo spacecraft. Now, at some point, I came to a passage in the book about the Bell Labs math department during the late 1930s and early 1940s. This is right on the cusp of World War II and the critical role that the mathematicians were playing in that research process. So there's this parenthetical reference mentioning the fact that by this time, the company employed a number of female mathematicians. And this wasn't even a full sentence dedicated to this fact that there were women working in the math department. But this seemingly throwaway reference at that point, and this is you know, at the end of this Hidden Figures tour, just commanded my full attention. So I'm reading it on the plane, I start getting agitated, I'm thumping the book with my finger and I'm almost shouting at my husband, I'm like, I knew it, you know, saying things like this. And of course my husband's trying to calm me down because people get thrown off of planes for doing things <laughs> less than that these days. Um, but reading that line, I felt like the past had given me a secret sign. Here was an American research and development organization, very similar in ambition and scope to the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, and that is the NASA's pre predecessor agency, where the women of hidden figures worked. Um, they were operating at the same time, and like aeronautics, the telecommunications industry required relentless experimentation, data collection, and analysis in order to improve a technology that was connecting our country and the world in ways that were previously only possible in science fiction. Bell Labs was like the NACA's laboratories, the oldest of which was the Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia, uh, where Hidden Figures takes place and where I grew up. And from my research, I knew that just during the years of World War II, the NACA hired and trained 400 female computers at the Langley Laboratory alone. And that group included Dorothy Vaughn and the other black women that I write about in my book. Now, before Hidden Figures, I would have read that line in the book and just kept moving. But what I had learned during my research was where to look for these women and where to look for evidence of their work. 
And I knew there was an army of women hiding in that snippet of text. And I could see them now, even though history hadn't. And when I started researching hidden figures back in 2010, I didn't realize that my story was actually about a multitude of women mathematicians. I started with the idea of writing a book about one heroic individual, and that was Katherine Johnson, who calculated the trajectories for the Project Mercury manned spaceflight missions. Um, she's been well known in a certain fashion for many decades in Hampton, Virginia. Um, and over the years, something of a first and only cult has grown up around her. Um, some people thought that she was the first or the only black woman to, uh, from her era to have worked at NASA, or even the first or only woman from that era to work there. Um, and what I can tell you is that from my very first interview, when I first started working on this book and sat down with her, she was not interested in being put on a pedestal by herself. And even as she talked to me about her own contributions to the space program, she was very clear about the fact that not only was she not the first black woman to get there at NASA, uh, when she showed up in 1953, she was welcomed by an entire room full of black female mathematicians. And she also told me unequivocally that the woman who ran that segregated group, uh, the West Area Computing Group, Dorothy Vaughn, was brilliant. And so by finding Dorothy and by finding these other women, I found not just the beginning of the story, but I also found its meaning. And the truth is, what I now believe is that one of the great underreported stories of the 20th century, and this is a century in which we taught machines to count we split the atom, we escape the bonds of gravity of our planet, and this is often referred to as the American century, that the hidden story of the American century is a story of women sitting in rooms doing math. Now, whenever I see scientific or technological process and advances that require experimentation, data collection, computation, and analysis, I start looking for the women. The first five black women started working at the Langley Laboratory in 1943, and I believe that when we count all 10 of the NASA centers from 1943 through 1980, there may have been as many as 80 black women working as computers, mathematicians, engineers, and scientists. And what's just as remarkable is that these women were part of a cohort of female mathematicians from all backgrounds that started in, starting in 1935 grew to be several hundred strong and perhaps more than a thousand women, all told. This is a thousand women working as professional mathematicians, getting up and going to work at NASA every day for decades. Realizing that female mathematicians were a critical part of NASA's advances helped me to make the connection between the women of NASA and other pi female pioneers in science, technology, and computing, like these women at Bell Labs. Also like the female computers and astronomers that did the fundamental work of classifying stars. These are the women who worked at the Harvard Astronomical Laboratory in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Davis Sobel writes about them in her book called The Glass Universe. And the women of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which of course eventually did become part of NASA as well, um, they were featured in a book by author Natalia Holt uh, called Rise of the Rocket Girls. There's also, of course, Grace Hopper, who became a computer programmer while serving in the Navy. Uh, there were the women programming the ENIAC computer to generate artillery tables uh, for the US Army at the University of Pennsylvania, and also the female code breakers at what would become the NSA. All of those groups of women served during World War II. And that begs the question that I receive more than any other when I am talking about hidden figures and this history, and that is, why haven't we heard the story before? These women's lives intersected so many of the signature moments and movements of the 20th century. World War II, the Cold War, the space race, the civil rights movement, and the fight for gender equality. So why has it taken us decades to tell the stories of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Christine Darden, and the other women who worked with them? Why didn't we turn these women into professional role models and use them to pull generations of young people, particularly young women, into the sciences and technology? Well, certainly part of the reason is the fact that during World War II and the Cold War, the Langley Laboratory, like many other defense installations, classified its research. So these were the days of loose lips sink ships. 
And, and during World War II, every building of the Langley Laboratory was painted dark green or black to camouflage the building. So um, in case there was an attack from the air, it would be very hard to find. Um, Langley's engineer in charge distributed memos. It was amazing for me to go through the archives, the National Archives, and find these memos from 1942 and 43. Um, he distributed memos warning employees to stay on the lookout for German spies hanging around the lab who might be disguised in the uniforms of the military base next door, of military soldiers who uh, the base was next door to the laboratory. Um, the most blatant of the reasons, I think, um, for the invisibility of these women was the physical separation of the workplace itself. So the black women worked in a segregated office. This was apart from the white women, even though they did the same job. Uh, they were forced to use the colored bathrooms and they ate at a colored table in a separate lunchroom. Uh, they knew that they had to come to work dressed to the nines, otherwise they might have been mistaken for a cafeteria worker, perhaps as the custodian. And then, furthermore, the women of all backgrounds in the beginning were separated from the men in separate computing pool offices. Uh, the women also um, had a really difficult time breaking out of the pools and getting the plum research and engineering assignments, um, and they were classified as sub-professional. There was literally um, a government classification, SP, which meant that they were one step above the clerical employees in the ladder, but they weren't classified as professional, which is where most of the male engineers and mathematicians came in. And that leads me to the biggest reason I believe that we haven't acknowledged these women before, and that is because for decades, computing was considered women's work. The men were the engineers, the women were the mathematicians. The men did the manly analytical work, this is the way it was seen, and the women did the rote computing. And most of these women, regardless of their race, again, were hired in at the bottom of the ladder. And that included, um, in the 1950s, Langley Laboratory began hiring black men. They were hired in as engineers, whereas all of the women tended to be hired in as sub-professional um, data analysts or computers. Um, and this is really goes to the heart of the, the challenge that we still see, uh, trying to parse what an engineer or a scientist looks like. And if we're having that problem today, just imagine the case of double vision that people had back in the 1950s and 60s when they were trying to focus their gaze on a black female mathematician or scientist. So why haven't we heard this story? I think this is a question that we'll be talking about as we do for, for many untold stories. Why haven't we to told these stories and heard these stories before? Um, it, it's going to remain a great question. But today, after three years um, of talking about hidden figures, three years after the book was published, three years after the movie came out, um, after having spoken to groups of every conceivable age, gender, race, ethnicity, class, professional background, and political persuasion, I'm much more intrigued by another question, and that is, why is this story so resonant for us today? Here's one possible explanation. When Dorothy Vaughn graduated from college in 1929, becoming a math teacher, that was the summit of expectations for a woman with mathematical talent. And then from the 1940s through the 1960s, the number of women who could or would reasonably be expected to follow in the footsteps of the women of hidden figures was tremendously small. And for those of us in the workplace today, and particularly for the youngest generation of women, these women's stories aren't a fairy tale or simple inspiration. It's a playbook in challenging gender and racial bias and disarming difficult colleagues learning to set your expectations high and refusing to take no for an answer. Thanks to the talent and the hard work and the contributions of these female pioneers, each of us has a greater voice in the workplace. And this room, this room is one of the legacies of the work of these women. It offers abundant evidence of the increase in opportunity over the years and the increase in expectations. Furthermore, I think one of the things about Hidden Figures that is so encouraging, and this is one of the things that I loved so much about this story, is it is not a story about an outlier or someone whose work was impossible to replicate. This is a story of group progress over time. We, we love the one first and only stories, and fortunately, I think, for all of us, that story does not fit this, that mold. These women were part of a vibrant community, 
They were part of a workplace that employed other people like them. And though they were exceptional, none of these women had to be the exception, the first or the only black woman, or the first or the only woman. They're really extraordinary, ordinary people, as I like to think of them. They were unassuming, very low-key about their work, but hardworking achievers nonetheless. Their goal, of course, it wasn't to stand out because of their differences. It was to fit in because of their talent. They wanted to be what I want to be and what I know every single person in this room wants to be. And that's what John Glenn said about Katherine Johnson in the Hidden Figures movie. He called her the smart one, just the right person at the right time for the job at hand. NASA was a connected organization, and Projects Mercury and Apollo were hyper-connected missions. There were more than 400,000 people working on the moon landing and bringing that to fruition in the summer of 1969. Every person working at NASA and all of the affiliated teams in the military, all of the private contractors, they knew that they were part of a mission that was, and, and many still ways still is, synonymous with innovation and with breakthroughs and making the impossible possible. NASA really wasn't a scientific agency simply concerned with the production of knowledge. It was an engineering agency. Its charge was to find practical solutions and show results in a constantly changing environment. And though we usually think of innovation as technology or product focus, Hidden Figures is also about how the job is only half done unless we bring innovation to people as well. The Hidden Figures phenomenon has given Dorothy, Catherine, Mary, and Christine their long overdue star turn, which is amazing. And, and this is sort of a, I'm still, just can't quite believe this whole Hidden thing, Figures thing has happened. Um, and I, I'm just stunned that these women from my hometown, these are women that I would see in the grocery store, um, who worked with my dad at NASA, whose children went to school with my mother, and whose grandchildren went to school with me. I, I just can't believe that they're household names or that, um, you know, for so long they were hidden, and now it's kind of a thing for little girls to dress up as these women on Halloween, um, which happens. Or, you know, I always see the, the, the round, they make the, the rounds on uh, Instagram and on Facebook, obviously these pictures um, of these adorable girls as um, 1950s versions of these women. Um, but, you know, these women, they always valued their connection with other people over taking the spotlight for themselves. They always gave credit to the people around them, and they always understood the power of working in a team. And this is something else that comes through this story, and I think it's another reason why it feels so fresh. Even though the incidents in the book and the movie happened six decades or more ago, and I think these women and their colleagues offer us concrete lessons about how we can give a greater voice to everyone in the workplace. So just a couple of notes about some of the things that happened behind the scenes and, and you know, to really illustrate that connection that happened uh, between these women and their colleagues. So one of NASA Langley's most notable leaders was a man named Melvin Butler. So Melvin Butler, he was Langley's head of personnel during World War II. Uh, he started out as a bicycle messenger. He became an assistant in the personnel office, and then he was promoted to head of the office and held that position until his retirement in 1975. During the war, it was his job to solve the problem of how to deal with the escalating need for computing power, which was happening concurrently with a shortage of male mathematicians who were being sent off to the, to the front to fight. First, he recruited white women at women's colleges, um, but he still needed more people. So after a 1941 executive order banning racial discrimination in the civil service, um, there was a new source of labor, black Americans who had been segregated out of the civil service from the Woodrow Wilson administration. Um, and then by the spring of 1943, applications of black women with math degrees began filtering onto Melvin Butler's desk. Now, the laboratory had employed African-Americans, but only in the typical roles of janitors and laborers and cafeteria workers. And Melvin Butler, he was from Virginia. He was from Portsmouth, Virginia. He was a local boy. Virginia was a segregated state at the time. So it required no imagination on his part to guess what his fellow Virginians might think of bringing Negro women into the lab Langley laboratory offices, uh, no matter how educated they might have been. Now, one of the things I always hoped to find when I was doing the research, and I think everyone who's writing a book like this, you always want the smoking gun that provides 
incontrovertible evidence of this person being at that place at that time saying exactly this thing. So I was always looking for the memo from Melvin Butler saying, I hereby authorize the employment of colored computers, this facility. Um, I never found that exact memo, but being a nonfiction writer is lot, a lot like being a prosecuting attorney. You have to build your case based on the evidence at hand. What I did know about Melvin Butler is that he was on the job when the first black women came to NASA, and the human resources buck stopped with Melvin Butler. By opening the door to these black female mathematicians, Butler gained critical support for the mission of his organization and of our country during World War II. But he also made a profound change in the DNA of NASA, and it's one that endures to this day. So sometimes the act of opening a door is enough to start a revolution. Now, Melvin Butler turned Langley into a racial relations laboratory as much as it was an aeronautical laboratory. Being a woman in a mostly male industry and being black in a predominantly white workplace usually meant that these women felt the pressure of representing an entire group of people, not just themselves. And the black women were keenly aware that the interactions that they had with their white colleagues, whether they were positive or negative, could have implications for the entire group. Dorothy Vaughn understood this, and she had a really unique uh, perspective on the groundbreaking role that her girls, and they all were referred to as girls, they called each other girls, even when I was doing interviews with these women many decades later, they would refer to each other and themselves as girls. Um, but Dorothy really had a, a, a unique perspective on the role that her girls occupied. So she herself was a talented mathematician, um, she was ready to tackle any computing jobs that the engineers laid on her desk. They would often ask for her personally to do their computing. But by 1949, Dorothy had been promoted to the head of the all-black West Area Computing Group. So she was responsible not just for her own career, but for the career of a room full of other women. And as a supervisor, Dorothy was in charge of leading the women in the group through the analysis that characterized you know, whatever it was, whatever the computing was that they had to do. She would sit down and walk them through it. And then what she had to do was to match the abilities of the person that she was reviewing to the assignments that flowed into the office. Um, the subtler management skill wasn't just to match those abilities, the raw abilities, but to match the temperaments with the different groups that were within NASA. So Katherine Johnson was in West Area Computing for just two weeks when Dorothy sent her to the Flight Research Division. And Dorothy knew, and this in the movie it's portrayed as a space task group, but this was actually sort of a related group. It was called the Flight Research Division within the Langley Laboratory. What Dorothy knew is by sending Katherine to this hard-charging group of brainy fellas, which is what Katherine Johnson always calls the guys she worked with, the brainy fellas, um, that she was sending the smart one. But Dorothy also knew that she was sending somebody who was going to be able to give as good as she got, somebody who would match the guys in that group, not just with her intellect, but in her full throttle approach to the work. Nobody knew the girls like Dorothy Vaughn, and nobody fought to put them in the right positions like Dorothy did. So if Dorothy were working in our, today, we would probably call her something like a player coach. This is somebody with hands-on technical knowledge and sharp people skills who made both the people below her and the people above her more valuable. I worked closely with the movie screenwriter and the director, and I appreciate many of the touches that they added to the film adaptation. And one of the motifs that appears throughout the movie is this idea of looking beyond. So Taraji P. Henson, who plays Katherine Johnson in the movie, and Kevin Costner, who plays Al Harrison, he's the fictional head of NASA, they use this phrase, looking beyond, to refer to the innovative mathematics that they're going to need in order to put John Glenn into orbit around the Earth. Looking beyond, that was really what the real-life women had to do just to make it through the door at NASA. And at a time when expectations and opportunities for women, particularly for black women, were very low, these women pushed themselves to excel at school. So they received excellent math educations at historically black colleges. Um, they went to Hampton University, it was then called Hampton Institute, West Virginia State, Wilberforce University, Howard University, all fantastically um, good at educating these women and preparing them for their careers. So that when the door opened for jobs as these professional mathematicians during World War II, 
These women were as prepared to succeed as any of the people they worked with. Then what these women had to do, they had to stand with their colleagues so that together all of them could look beyond the earth into the unknown of space, helping to take humanity on an unprecedented mission to the heavens. Doing something that had never been done before, whether that thing was integrating a workplace or sending a man into space, was never a, a deterrent to these women. They were intrepid women of science, and they also considered themselves to be agents of social change. Of course, what the women were asking of their colleagues was for them to look beyond race, to look beyond their gender, and just to see their talent. And that's what many of the engineers did. So Casimir Sarnicki was an engineer who came to the laboratory in 1939 when Dorothy Vaughn um, was working as the head of the um, West Area Computing Group. And Dorothy assigned Mary Jackson to Kaz's group. It was called the Four Foot by Four Foot Supersonic Pressure Tunnel. And uh, it was doing experiments at the speed of sound up to two times, the, uh, from the speed of sound to two times the speed of sound, um, which was, you know, very exciting research at the time. They were doing that in the 1950s. Um, Kaz was a knight, he was a white Catholic from Massachusetts, and Mary was a black Southerner. She was raised in the African Methodist Epis Episcopal Church. And a casual observer might assume that the two of them could, couldn't have anything possibly in common. Um, but one of the things that they shared, they discovered after they started working with each other, was a commitment to scouting. Mary was a Girl Scout leader. She was in her, her entire life. Kaz was a lifelong Boy Scout leader, so that was one of their connections. Um, more importantly, though, they shared a passion for engineering. And Kaz recognized Mary's talent very soon after she landed in his group, and he was not about to leave brain power on the table. He said to her, listen, Mary, you can't spend your entire career in the computing pool. You've got to be an engineer. And then what he did was he went on to make her success his responsibility by, resp by sponsoring her for the engineer and training program, even as that required her to get a special permit from the city of Hampton because the required courses were held at a then segregated white high school. So finding a mentor who can look beyond the surface and see our true talents, I think that is something that all of us dream of, and it's really the holy grail of any workplace. So Mary moved up steadily over the years. She collaborated with Kaz Sarnicki for two decades. Um, she reached a level of GS-12, um, and she was the highest ranking black woman at NASA Langley. In the 1970s, the promotion stopped coming. And when Mary looked around, she noticed that there were a lot of ambitious women of all backgrounds uh, who were in the same situation. And she asked herself, what is the best use of my remaining years here at NASA Langley? Does the world really need another GS-12 engineer, even if that GS-12 engineer is a black woman? And what she did, decided to do then um, really is one of the most moving parts of this research for me, and it didn't make it into the movie, but she decided to abandon the engineering career that she had fought so hard for, and she accepted an open position in human resources where she felt she would be able to help all of the women at the center. And she made this decision even though it meant taking a demotion and moving backwards to GS-11. And, you know, the thing about Mary, she, she was an engineer through and through. She had years of experience at this point. She knew how engineers thought, she knew how they worked, and she knew what they valued. She was very good with numbers, um, naturally, and like Dorothy Vaughn, she had taught herself over the years to move from the mechanical computing machines into programming electronic computers. So in this new human resources position, uh, she used her programming skills to dig into the employee database, or as one of the women who worked with her said, we hacked into the computer. <laughs> um, they went in, they got all of the detail about the people there at the center, and what she found was that even when women and men with the same qualifications and had the same performance reviews were coming up for promotion, the women did not get the same promotions, and they didn't get the corresponding salaries. And this was something about which senior management was pretty oblivious until Mary and um, Gloria Champagne was the name of the other woman um, who did this analysis and presented the report. These facts, until that moment, really had existed squarely in their blind spots. So Mary created charts. She made the case for the overlooked women at the center. Um, she was determined to fix the discrepancies, and she, she changed minds. She got results. 
She mentored and trained other women to help her in this mission, and she and her colleagues were able to use those number crunching and programming skills to level the playing field for the next generation of talented women, including Dr. Christine Darden, who went on to become uh, one of NASA's and also one of the world's international experts on supersonic aircraft. And if you've read the book, you know Dr. Darden's story, but she's not actually in the movie because she was the next generation. Um, she actually went to school with the children of Christine Darden and Dorothy Vaughn and also with my mother at Hampton University. Now, of course, Mary recognized that her own voice had been amplified by the support of people like Dorothy Vaughn and Kazimir Sarnicki. And um, she really went out of her way to ensure that the women that she worked with who were coming up behind her had the chance to have their voices heard as well. We live in a culture that places a premium on individual success and personal branding. But one of the incredible things about Mary Jackson is that she truly saw achievement as something that functions like a bank account. It's something that you draw on when you're in need, and it's something that you make deposits to when you're blessed with a surplus. Mary worked very hard for decades to, to help others do, reach their potential. And what she understood and what she really believed, um, and everyone who talks about her mentions this, that helping others unlock their potential essentially is raising up an army in the service of the things you believe in most. And what Mary's career teaches us, I think, is that sometimes the best use of our individual talents is helping to liberate the talents of other people. And those people, as we know, are among the most valuable, valuable people in our careers and in our lives. Now, one of the things, finally, that all of these people had in common, and this is something that I found was characteristic of most of the women that I wrote about, um, and common, I think, to people who have careers that aren't just successful, but also meaningful, is taking the long view. Dorothy Vaughn was working in a laundry room uh, during World War II to make extra money during her summers off as a math teacher in Farmville, Virginia, when she applied for this job at the Langley Laboratory. So like a lot of people during World War II, she thought that she was going in for a commission that lasted six months, and what she found was a career that lasted 30 years. Katherine Johnson was born in 1918, and Katherine Johnson is still with us. She just turned in August 101 years old. Um, she still lives in Hampton, Virginia. Unfortunately, her husband, Jim, um, who is portrayed in the movie, just died earlier this year. But Katherine Johnson, who is, who is an incredible person, born in 1918, was facing a statistic, which is that a black baby girl born in 1918 had a 2% chance of finishing high school. Catherine, of course, she went on to co-author the research report that laid out the trajectory math for John Glenn's 1962 space flight. Uh, when she was a college student at West Virginia Institute, uh, one of her professors spotted her talent and prepared her for a career as a research mathematician. She asked her, where am I going to get a job? He said, I don't know. That's your problem. I'm just here to prepare you. Um, it took her 18 years to find that job, um, working for Dorothy Vaughn at the Langley Laboratory, but the rest is history. In 1917, in Hampton, Virginia, an 11-person staff hung out a shingle at the Flying Field and Aeronautical Proving Ground um, that became the Langley Laboratory. And there was no way for that group of people back then, um, 102 years ago, to imagine what the future held in store. Not one, but two world wars, jet engines, nuclear weapons, Planes that could fly faster than the speed of sound, vehicles that would take humans to the moon and back and bring, bring them back here safely, and maybe even most improbably of all of those things, the fact that women mathematicians, including a cohort of black women, would be a necessary part of that mission. There's no way for us to know today exactly what the future has in store for us in terms of technology. But we know that individuals will always seek to find work that brings them personal satisfaction, that allows them to build a rewarding future for themselves and their families. Organizations are always going to need to identify leaders, and then those leaders, they're going to have to find the talented people and allow them to achieve their missions. And then once inside, these talented people are going to have to come together with others and build a culture in which both individuals and the organization as a whole will excel. So 
It's sometimes amazing to me that Hidden Figures has become such a rallying cry for women in the workplace because it is an unsparing work look um, at a time and that all too often gave its worst to people who tried to give its, their best to the workplace and to our country. We forced the black women to sit in a separate office and to use the colored bathrooms and colored um, cafeteria, even as they were charting our country's path to the heavens. We systematically paid all of the women less than the men, even when those women were doing the same work. And we relegated their work to footnotes and afterthoughts and failed to give adequate credit for their research efforts. So I'm not sure when I look at the history if we really deserve their patriotism, their grace under pressure, the way they used dignified competence to rebuke bigotry, and the way they wielded their intellects to hack away at the stubborn underbrush of low expectations. But the optimism of this story, I think, the optimism comes from showing what's possible when we figure out how to push people with the brightest lights to step out of the shadows, and when we allow them to raise their voices, no matter who they are or where they're from. The idea that the future can be better than the past, and that each of us has an opportunity and a responsibility to contribute to it, I think that's probably the greatest lesson that these women have to teach us. Despite our differences, we are connected to each other as families, as communities, as colleagues, and as citizens. And these women and their stories also provide evidence that even in these fractured times, when it seems that so many of us see ourselves as incompatibly different from our neighbors and our colleagues and our fellow citizens, that when we are able to truly connect each with each other, we are able to share a vision of a better world and step into the future together. Thank you.